and a very warm welcome to NARC's Future Communities 21 online conference. This is a very special event for two reasons, one for NALC and one very personal to me. Firstly, this is the first ever online conference NALC has delivered over the course of a whole day. This complements our monthly online event series introduced last spring and held at lunchtimes. Attended by a remarkable two and a half thousand people to date, many of whom for the very first time. So bear with us and I hope you'll very much enjoy this event, which wouldn't have been possible without our fantastic sponsors, BHIB Council's Insurance, Blush Air Illumination and CCLA, as well as Fluid Productions. The second reason is that after five proud years as NALC's chair, my tenure ends next week, and this will be my final NALC conference as the chair. It's been a real privilege to lead the local council sector and help deliver many achievements. And I'm looking forward to saying more about that when I speak later on today. So it feels appropriate to be leaving on a high at NALC's first ever full day online conference with such a fantastic program covering the big issues our sector faces. Now, as we continue to emerge from, but still live with the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see the impact it has left on our lives, our communities and our country. We can look back with immense pride at the way parish and town councils, our most local councils, stepped up and rose to the challenge of the crisis to support their communities. The pandemic really shone a light on the crucial difference local councils can make to people's lives. And we now see that local leadership will continue as local councils help build stronger, thriving and resilient future communities, which is the theme of today's conference. Through our plenary sessions today, you'll hear from a range of high profile experts and leading figures in local government and public sector and be able to put your questions to them. Our series of workshops will cover a range of relevant subjects, running side by side and then repeated, offering useful tips and sharing good practice. All of today's workshops and plenary sessions will be recorded and available on the event platform after the event. And the exhibition marketplace will connect you with specific sector services and products with the chance to engage in one-to-one -one meetings direct throughout the day. There'll also be the chance to meet our conference headline sponsors, again, BHIB Council's Insurance, CCLA and Blush Hour Illumination. So do please take up the opportunity. And there'll be two coffee breaks and a lunch break during which you can network with other delegates on the online cafe. So I'm sure you'll agree that this event will give you a fantastic opportunity to discuss and debate the key issues facing our communities now and in the future. A few brief housekeeping announcements. On your screen, please use the sidebar navigation buttons on the left hand side to navigate between sessions. There will be regular text message announcements posted by the platform by the event help desk. And there's a frequently asked question page accessible on the left hand side of your screen to answer all your other technical queries about navigating around the platform. However, do click the help desk button on the frequency asked page if you want to post any direct queries throughout the day and someone will get back to you from the help desk. There will be a short five minute break between sessions throughout the day. But now we're joined by the new president of the Local Government Association, Baroness Tani Gray Thompson, DBE, for our very first plenary session of the day. Enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you very much and good morning to everyone. And it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you today online. Um, can I start by apologising? I am in a travel lodge in Bath 
Um, so that is my lovely background. So I'm uh, I'm back to uh, kind of travelling and in-person meetings. So uh, I have a bit of a complicated week. So I wanted to make sure that I was somewhere with um, good Wi-Fi. So um, I'm going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes and then um, open the floor for any questions that you might have. Um, also, uh, I would like to give you my email address, which I'll do at the beginning and at the end. Um, it's T at parliament.uk uh, and if anyone would like to get in touch with me um, after the event I'd be delighted to hear from you. Um, so today is as much about saying hello and introducing who I am and getting to know different people uh, and the issues that you face on a, a daily basis because the best way I can do my job as LJ president is to know what you think about everything uh, and so um, I thought I'd just give you a brief background on me and how I came to be uh, the president and I do have to say uh, as a, a non-elected member of the House of Lords when I went through the election process I do have a tiny understanding really tiny what it's like to go through an election process waiting for the votes to come in and having this sudden panic what happened if, if I wasn't voted in but um, I, um, I grew up in Cardiff I was born with spina bifida and uh, I was a wheelchair user from very young and I was incredibly lucky with my family and my parents in that they believed in diversity, equality and inclusion before those words really existed. Um, I was brought up to the same expectations around me as my older sister and they didn't treat me differently because I was a wheelchair user, which was amazing. I was um, able to start off in mainstream school because I could walk a little bit when I, I started school. And that is the most important thing that ever happened to me. Um, and I, I, education in all forms is so important because if I'd gone into the special school system, I wouldn't have had an education. And an education gave me access to sports and it gave me access to politics and the life that, that I have now. Um, but when I was due to go to high school and I thought I was at the same school, going to go to the same school my sister was at, um, we had a letter from that head teacher which said we don't take people like Tani at our school. And I remember my mom was really angry and the school we were offered as an option, the special school, like the word, but we went to look at it and my parents were just kind of devastated and like you're not going there because they didn't do any exams with the children um you, you're allowed to do maybe three cse's that was it that was the most exams that you could set certainly they had no o levels on the program uh, and, and nothing else and really that school w was just keeping people occupied till they left and quite a lot went into either care homes or some form of care in the community and so my, my first experience of politics was when I was 10 years old and my father sitting down and telling me that there was someone called Mary Warnock, Baroness Warnock, and he'd found that she'd done a lot of work on education for disabled children. And he gave me the work that she'd done and told me to read it and understand it. <laughs> I was 10. Um, and, you know, little did I realise that years later my life would be made up of white and green papers. But... Um, my, basically, the, the, the long story short is my father threatened to sue the Secretary of State for Wales over my right to go to a mainstream school because that's what Baroness Warnock had said that I had the right to be educated in the best environment for me. And so from quite young, I started understanding political levers and change. And all the way through sort of childhood growing up, my parents told me how privileged I was. And I was. I grew up in a very loving home. We had food on the table we had holidays, we, we were very privileged. And um, from actually a really young age, my father telling me I needed to give something back. And this sport thing was lovely, but you know, um, and I found sport, did five Paralympics, won 16 medals. Um, but through that, I had the opportunity to travel the world and see how other disabled people were treated, uh, how other people were treated, how women were treated in different countries. Um, yeah, how, how I was treated uh, as a, a disabled woman. So, you know, sorry, I was just an option on my, my 
computer. Um, so it kind of opened my eyes to the wider world. And, you know, I got to visit Lebanon, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, Rwanda, um, lots of places had a big impact on my life. Um, so at the end of my sports career, I had the chance to go into the process to be a crossbench peer, which I took. I got through that. Uh, and I have to say that is the um, weirdest interview process, actually, if I'm honest. The first question I was asked in my interview was, what is the most interesting debate you've ever listened to in the House of Lords? And I think I panicked slightly and said all of them. And then my panel laughed at me and said, you know, they're not all really, you know, there are some fascinating and, you know, uh, anyway, that what was amazing about that process is it wasn't like a job interview. It wasn't what you're going to do in your first hundred days. It was what you're going to do in your first 10 years. And, you know, the system we have is not ideal by any stretch of, of the imagination. But for me, it was a, an amazing process in terms of thinking about actually what was I going to do and what are the things that I'm interested in changing. So uh, I work in sport and physical activity because that's a big part of, of my life. I um, do uh, legislation around things like domestic abuse, um, women's rights, uh, disability rights, um, well, on legal aid. Um, so when I was asked to become, first of all, LGA vice president, and I went through all the things that the LGA does, I was like, yeah, I'm interested in that. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. And, and partly, I think as well, um, my, da my dad had lots of things he used to tell, tell us. One of the things was about council tax or rates or whatever it's been called over the years. And, and he always used to say to, to, to me and my sister, you know, if you earn money, you pay because it's roads and police and uh, we, and, uh, and education and uh, all, all, all these things. So for me, that sort of connection from, from LGA back to councils, back to local district, that, that all the levels um, in between are really important because we can't affect change in the House of Lords. Uh, we can to some extent, not on our own, without lots and lots of other people and support. And coming back to what I said about the beginning, it's about knowing the issues and the challenges and the good things that are happening on the ground, day in, day out. Because we're at our most effective in the Lords when we have a piece of legislation and we're able to say, if we do this, it will affect this group of people this way or this group of people that way. Um, and I think w one thing that was made very clear to me when I went to the Lords was that the thing that got you there, and in my case, it was sport and physical activity, not having been an athlete, but my work that I did in that space while I was an athlete, you're expected to remain an expert in. And the reality is we can't be an expert in absolutely everything, but that's where actually my life as an athlete taught me. It's, it's not just what you do, it's your training partners, it's your coaches, it's all the other people around you that help you be the, the best you can. So um, I had some great mentors when I, I went to the Lords in terms of um, explaining how you have to have that sort of connection to be able to do the best job you can in, in terms of when we, we get legislation. So um, one of the roles I have as well, I currently chair UK Active, which is uh, the membership body for the health and fitness sector. Uh, I've done that for the last six years. My term is due to end next year. Um, because actually, uh, I have a passion for physical activity. Uh, I recognise that not everyone wants to play sport. Uh, but, but actually, this is about being physically active. And all of us could do with being a bit more physically active than we are. And this is not about performance pathway. It's not about, everyone thinks I'm going to talk about, you all have to play organized sport and do hundred miles a week running. It's absolutely not that. That's, you know, slightly separate to what I do. But for me, I, I care as we've seen so many people do care about this. I would be dead without the NHS. Some of, uh, a couple of the surgeries I had growing up uh, and I didn't have many. My parents would never have, if we were under an insurance model or my parents had to pay for it, 
they would never have been able to afford to pay for the surgery uh, that I have. The other reason I care about it, my sister's a nurse, my brother-in-law's a doctor. I see what they do and, and their commitment every single day. Um, but I care about the NHS and one of the ways that we can all help protect the NHS is to be fitter and healthier. Uh, and 66% of cancer prehab and rehab uh, takes place within the leisure sector. It, and I, I kind of firmly believe we have to do more to, to unlock the, the health and fitness sector and make a connection with individuals. So things like um, diabetes, forms of that can be prevented with uh, physical activity as opposed to medication. I'm doing a lot of work on social prescribing uh, and so this is about encouraging uh, doctors not to write uh, a prescription for medication, but to write a prescription to go to an art class or to do some physical activity or to volunteer or to do a whole range of things which is not linked purely uh, to, to medication. Um, and it's about the healthy mind, body, spirit. Uh, I realise I, I have moments where I sound like I'm evangelical about physical activity. I suppose I am a little bit. Um, but but actually, for a huge number of people, it makes a difference. And and what we've seen in the pandemic, uh, in terms of people's mental wealth and health, uh, well, mental health and well-being, we're in a really difficult time for so many people. Um, and for young people, uh, my daughter was doing A-levels during lockdown, and it gives you a whole new appreciation for teachers. Um, but we, we have to find different ways of, of helping um, people out of, of this really difficult time that we've all been through. But in the, the public leisure space, uh, which is so incredibly important because the position in the public leisure centres and provision are in uh, a lot of the time in areas of, of deprivation and, you know, where people don't have lots of choices uh, about what they do. The pandemic has had a massive hit on those sites and um, 400 um, different sites of different types of provision have been lost during the pandemic. And it's not just about the loss of the site, uh, it's about the jobs, the roles, the secondary spend has a, a big impact on, on, on local communities. What we see, um, uh, and I remember when uh, when I was asked to be vice president, somebody said to me, "You're interested in local planning." I was like, "Well, sort of, but it's not, you know, it's not right at the top of the things that I work on day in day out. It's it's rapidly moved up the list because it's easier to open a chicken shop on the high street than it is to open a yoga studio. Um, and actually, we need to do a lot around revitalising our local communities." Uh, and making sure that they're there to stay uh, for the long term. So when I was asked to be um, LGA president, I kind of went through the list again and it was like, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, still interested in, in, in all those um, different things. And it's been amazing to have the opportunity uh, to go out to meet people uh, either in real life or, or online, um, to be able to be connected to all those different issues. Um, I have to say my, my role as president is honorary. Uh, I don't come with any great power or anything. Uh, I guess the power I have is the platform that I've been given uh, to speak uh, and to represent uh, uh, different people. So um, I'm looking, I've, I've talked for far too long. Um, if there were medals for talking, my husband always says I'd win. He'd also say that I'd talk to a door if I thought it would answer. Um, but uh, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to, to be part of today's session. Um, I do appreciate it. I'll give you my email address again. It is Grey Thompson. Oh, I should spell it actually, G-R-E-Y, Thompson with a P, then the letter T. <laughs> oh, I'd love to have a name you didn't have to spell all the time, at parliament.uk. And um, please feel free to, to email me on any issue that you're interested in. Um, you will get an out of office from me. Uh, I, I do want to warn you that just says we have lots of emails. We get between 800 and 1,000 emails a week. Um, so, um, but but I will get round as soon as I possibly can to to answer in your emails. Um, and I'd like to hand uh, back to Sue if that's okay. And if you've got any questions you'd like to ask me, 
um, I'd be delighted to answer them. Uh, or if you'd like to just go for another coffee, I'd be very happy with that as well. So thank you very much for your time, Sue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. That was um, incredible and, and really inspiring as well. And to, to sort of hear your life story and, and, and what you've achieved, I think, is, is brilliant. I've got a couple of questions. One I will confess from, from me, uh, but I'll go to one first that's been, been posted here. Um, things haven't changed so much from your education experience as I'm trying so hard to get people to listen to disability rights. I have problems around disability housing for people. It's my highest caseload. We have legislation, we have no enforcement. How do we change that? Big question there. <laughs> uh, that's a good one to get started on. Um, education hasn't changed that much. You know, the, the work that Mary Warnock did was groundbreaking but I still deal with a number of education cases every year where the Academy's legislation allows a head teacher to exclude a disabled child or any child really that they think may be too difficult to cope with. Um, that's one of the things that I'd really hoped would have changed. Um, actually, one of my proudest moments was to be in the chamber 30 years after Baroness Warnock's work and say, because of you, I'm here. She didn't look massively impressed, to be honest, but um, we, we shouldn't still be fighting for the, some of the same things that we were fighting for 30 and 40 years ago. Um, but we are in terms of education, transport, it's improved a bit. I mean, well, buses have improved a lot. Trains haven't um, improved that much. Trains were meant to be step free by January the 1st, 2020. We're now being told it's going to be 2070. I was going to say before I can get on a train without any help, but I'm not going to be around in 2070. So I'm never in my life going to be able to get on a train the same way as a non-disabled person. That's, that's quite sort of scary when I think about it. And then you write about housing around access to buildings. The coronavirus legislation was pretty hard, <laughs> necessary to, to, to an extent, but that didn't help disabled people either. So I'm sorry, there's not lots of solutions um, in this answer, but actually I was in a meeting yesterday and I was saying, where is our um, Me Too moment? Where is our Black Lives Matters moment for disabled people? Um, and we haven't had it yet. Uh, and, and sometimes you hear about the deaths uh, and the suicides of disabled. It doesn't, doesn't break through. And as much as I don't want a moment that will change attitudes, we kind of need a moment where people will stop and say, OK, what are we going to do for disabled people? And the 2012 games were amazing and stunning and incredible but they did not change the world for disabled people and um we we have to do more in terms of joining it all up uh joining up support services from children through to adulthood uh the benefit system needs work not every disabled person's on benefits um but but we need to be able to join things up in a much better way than than we're able to at the moment Um, I've got another couple have come in now. What has surprised you about local most about uh, local government? So, what's been the biggest surprise that you've unearthed? I my phone because I think I've lost you. I can still hear you. Oh, good. Is it possible to, I know to temporarily. Yeah, I think we've, I think we've lost Tammy for a second. I think one of the, one of the challenges of uh, trying to connect, I think from a, from a hotel while she's traveling 
between London and Hereford at the moment. So if we can, if you can just bear with us for a second while she, she reconnects. I must say that really was an inspiring uh, speech from, from Tani. It's, uh, it's been really great to learn of her, ah, her experiences. I think we're back. Hello, sorry, I thought it might be quicker to drop out and come back in. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Did you hear the question that was posed? No, I didn't, repeat sorry. <laughs> right, what has surprised you about local government so far? <laughs> I knew how hard people worked and how passionate people are. Um, so I've been going out trying to meet um, local councils around where I live, plus further afield. I think it's the breadth that councillors are meant to be experts in. Uh, and I think just... Yeah, the, the breadth of their knowledge and their expertise um, and their passion, I think. Not, that, it didn't surprise me. That's the nice bit about it. So everyone I've spoken to is just really passionate about bringing about change. Whether you agree with the change they want to bring about or not, that's a slightly separate issue. But the fact they put themselves forward for a role which is not always it's it, glamorous, it's long hours, it's, it's hard work. Um, so I suppose there's admiration there. Um, I'm not sure there's anything that actually surprised me, but um, it's more that how many people are willing to give of themselves is just lovely. Mm. And I guess I'm really keen. So I, I, the list of things I'm interested in is basically everything in the world. Um, I'm really interested in young people's engagement in voting and putting themselves forward and and having a voice um and I, I think some things that i've seen lovely is the councillors you know making sure they talk to young people and go out there and, and sort of go above them and beyond so um yeah not surprised but just makes you feel really nice there are people willing to put themselves forward actually thank you uh, thank you and i think i think building on that and i've got another question here i think specifically about young people um, inspiring to hear uh, about your dad giving giving you the paper from Baroness Warnock and that being, whoops, hold on, my screen's just wobbled in front of me, uh, and that being a challenge, but clearly an inspiration. What would you say is the most effective way parishes could engage with young people to help? Excuse me, I'm reading this from the side of a screen here and the screen keeps moved to help by giving them facilities such as skate parks or to challenge them by asking them to engage with questions and make decisions about issues we might sometimes think are beyond their ability to understand because of their youth. Oh, so um, we, we have um, an outreach programme in the House of Lords and it's always really challenging because you'll, you will always get some young person who finds out how many bottles of champagne were drunk in parliament last year and then they think <laughs> that mps and peers drink them you have to explain no that it's the social events that that are held in the, the building you know sadly i don't drink 14 bottles of champagne a week uh, i think that's the last school i went to that's what it worked out as per peer um so it's fascinating when i go to the schools a lot of young people will say we hate politics and they may mention names of people they don't like. Quite often they'll mention question time in the Commons, mm. that mm. they don't like it. And I try to spend time explaining that's that's a moment, so that's the theatre of, of politics. That is not what MPs and peers do day in, day out. And, you know, our question time is, is much calmer uh, and more polite. And I think we get better answers, to be, be honest. You say to young people, what are you interested in? What do you care about? People care about something. And I think some of it is about trying to spend time with them to tease out what they're interested in. Um, and um, they, they've all got ideas for the future. Whether I think some of those ideas are slightly, you know, not of this world or not, is doesn't matter. It, it's about actually listening to young people and then feeling that they've been listened to. And actually, I think sometimes, 
you know, bringing different people together with different views. You do, I mean, it's diversity in business has been recognized for years. Um, you know, actually bringing different views together to try and find a solution is important. So um, I remember going to a school and uh, a group of young girls saying to me they hated politics. And then they told me that one of their friends had sadly died. And the head teacher had said they, they wanted to have a bench in the school. And the head teacher said, yeah, if you raise the money yourself. And it was quite a lot to buy this bench. And they raised it. And then the head teacher said, well, I don't really want the bench. And so I said to these young people, that's politics. The head teachers made you a promise and has now broken it. So actually, what are you going to do? And they were saying, well, I'm gonna... right, OK, are you going to have a protest? I wouldn't say that's your first option. Are you going to have a petition? Are you going to go back and say, well, actually, you did say this. That affecting change is politics. I'm, I'm not sure the teacher was very happy that that's where our discussion went uh, in terms of how they could get the, the bench. But um, for me, I think there's, there's a bit of a, a responsibility to explain to people wider politics, that, that local politics is not always like question time, you know, actually. You need to learn to read loads of papers. Um, the best skill I learned at university was reading a lot of papers in a short amount of time and being able to write something. Um, so I think, you know, I, in some of the work I do with young people, it's it's showing them public papers and saying, OK, this is what you and helping them through. I, I grew up in a family where we, we never taught party politics to this day. My parents both died. I have no idea how either of my parents voted. They never talked about it. They were very private about that. But we talked about things in politics. And I grew up sort of my dad telling me how stuff worked. A lot of young people don't get that. So I think explaining to young people how, how things work is really important. And it's it's time and, and everyone is time short. But but I think it's time worth investing to actually pull people together to get sort of those those different ideas. Because actually, you know, I, I I dealt with something actually when you said skate park relatively recently where someone was, oh, well, I don't know skate. But actually, if young people have got places to go, place is really important. Mm. You know, if they've got places to go that keep them off the street, that builds community, that, you know, builds relationships, you know, that, that's stuff that, that needs to be done. In my head, I still think I'm 12, you know, and I'm actually, I nearly said grown up. I'm an adult now. And, you know, the world has changed so much since I was a teenager, out of all recognition. Um, and, and, we have to listen to the people who are living in that, that different world. Thank you. Thank you. I can empathise with the, the, the 12 bit. I still don't know what I want to do when I grow up. But, so <laughs> I've got uh, a question here around social prescribing, because this is something that's quite close to our hearts in our sector, because it's something we can really contribute towards and help with. Uh, social prescribing is the way of the future, but people are reluctant to trust it over a clinician's view. How do we make, how do we do more to publish the positives and give people confidence in it as a, as a solution? Any ideas? I think it's, <laughs> yeah, again, it's, it's time. It's about building relationships with people. Um, you know, if you go to a GP, you get a seven minute appointment to, uh, you know, maybe 10 minutes if you're lucky. Um, it's actually social prescribing doesn't work if it's seven minutes, um, because you have to find out what connects people and what engages them um, about what form of physical activity they want to do. So example is my sister, you would think we, we weren't from the same family. She doesn't care about competing. She's probably the least competitive person you've ever met. Um, and uh, she wanted to do more physical activity. And you think I'd kind of know about that, wouldn't you? And so we had all these different discussions about what she could do and what she wanted to do. And none of them quite worked for her. And the, the thing I did not suggest to her at the time, because she's a very different character and personality to me, I didn't suggest military fitness to her because I just thought, oh, well, she's not going to connect to that. Actually, I don't connect to military fitness because I don't want someone in the park screaming at me because I'd probably have a row back. Um, and then my sister tried it and she was like, this is amazing. I was like, really? Did, 
And so for me, um, this was quite a few years ago, this was a really important wake up call for me to not bring my perceptions and my view of, and I know my sister really well, my view of it to, to what connected to her. And this is one of the things that brought me into social prescribing was, was actually that time that you need to, to find the connection. Because actually, if you've never done it, how do you know if you like it? So I think mm. there is there's something we need to do more with, with GPs um, to help them understand. Because actually, a lot of GPs' work-life balance is not great. So they don't have, always have a lot of time to be physically active or, or do other things. Um, mm -hmm. We have an amazing set of key workers. So there's an organisation called the National Academy of Social Prescribing. Uh, have a look at the work they do. We, I'm a trustee and we were um, very lucky. We had um, a grant from the Department for Health, uh, Department of Health at the time, uh, ongoing. Um, in, in terms of setting this up and, and making those connections and talking to people. And we work with the Arts Council and Sport England and, and just any organisation because it's about finding that connection. And some of the work, really good work I've seen, there's um, leisure provision. I mean, there, there's lots of these all over the country, but uh, the most recent one I visited was it's called Graves in Sheffield. And they've got the GP surgery and um, heart rehab prehab based in the leisure centre so if you've had a heart attack and you go to visit the gp they don't just tell you to be active they walk you across the corridor into a class because everyone has really good intentions when you're told to do more activity but the further you away from the gp the less you do so um you, you need to guide people in and, and hold their hand a little bit um and then engage them and, and connect them and if that doesn't work, find other ways. So t time's the answer to a lot of things. Um, it, it, yeah. It's going to take time um, to embed this more widely, but it takes time with individuals to find the connection that will change their behaviour because physical activity is one of those things people keep putting off. What we yeah. see now is people hitting frailty in their 40s, which means they have a really long, not great life. We're actually... and. and Please don't take this out of context and it sounds quite harsh when I say it, but you want people to be hitting frailty in the late 80s and, mm. and having a very short period of their life where they're frail, not 40 years of their life while they're frail. Um, so, yeah. so we have to do more. That sounds, I mean, it sounds awful when I say it, but it, it's about giving people quality of life for as long as possible. And actually this needs to start in schools, not, not necessarily when you're in your 30s or 40s. It needs to start much, much lower down. So I think in schools, we need to have a different relationship with physical activity, especially girls who don't always have great experiences. We need to make that experience much more positive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was that was really inspiring and, and very thought provoking as well. And I think sort of demonstrate how changing people, I think, and changing people's ideas and views and the way we think is probably one of our biggest challenges. Sadly, we're running out of time, Tammy, and I've, I've still probably got about half a dozen questions here that people have submitted. Do you mind if we share them with them with you afterwards? I know you've got Absolutely. a really busy diary, um, so I'm not asking you to make any commitments whatsoever, but if we could please share them, share them with you, that would be brilliant. And thank you know, very much and again anyone who'd like to email me please do thank you very much for your time that, that was a really inspiring uh talk and a great start to the day thanks very much tanny thank you, thank you.